Let's continue our study of arrays of primitive data by designing a program to play Yahtzee. Here's the problem statement. Implement part of the game of Yahtzee is a two-player game. Use only the above line scores. Now, you need to be familiar with the rules of Yahtzee to do this. If you haven't played the game before, go to Wikipedia and read about the rules. Here's a summary for those of you who've played the game in the past, but maybe not that recently. Each player rolls five dice up to three times. They try to match the number on the dice, and the score is the total of the matching dice only. The other dice don't get counted. And you can only score once for each of the six numbers. So you can match ones once, twos once, threes once, and so on. This should give you a little review. Now, what should you do if you don't know the game? Well, if you don't know Yahtzee, you need to learn the rules before implementing it. Never try to program something you don't understand. It doesn't work. So reading Wikipedia is one place to start, but there are other options too. One is to find a friend and play the game. This is a very common game in the United States, and so it's likely that one of your friends will know how to play. The other thing you could do is look for an online version and play it. Make sure you know the rules before trying to proceed. Don't program things you don't understand. Usually we write test data first, but this is a problem because this program is completely dominated by randomness. So there's really no way to systematically write test data in advance. So this means we're going to need to check the output carefully and frequently, very carefully, very frequently. We've got to consider our options for storing data. Now there are two arrays of primitive data types that are going to show up in this problem. One is the score for the six elements and the other is the five dice. Now we're going to want to create constants for the size of the array. That may seem a little silly since it's likely that we'll be playing with six sided dice for a while and because the logic of the game dictates that there would be six scores, but it's still a nice thing to do. The dice will have to be set randomly. We've worked through the logic of this earlier in the semester. So let's go to our program and add those elements in. So our main program is where we're going to want to put the scores. Notice that I've already asked for the players to enter their names. So we'll have an integer array for player one scores and an integer array for player two scores. Now, what I created there, remember, are not actually arrays. They're references. So in order to create the arrays, we have to call a new operator. Let's do that here. Player one scores equals new int of well, in order to know how big it should be, we need to know the name of the constants. So let's go up and take a look. It looks like our constant is turns. So that's what we'll use there. Now you'll notice I put the constants outside of the main program, but inside the class. That's the proper position for these constants. And then player two scores is going to be new int of turns. Now the dice array is a little different because it's going to show up somewhere else in the program. So we're going to have to think through where that belongs later. Now we're going to have to think also about how we're going to store the scores. Remember that in Yahtzee you're only allowed to score each category one time. What this means is there's a difference between having a score of zero and not having scored the category. Because when you have a score of zero, for example, if none of your dice match the number you were trying to match, that category can't be rescored later. But if you haven't scored for that number, it can. So we really have to separate these things. The way that I would do that is by initializing the scores array to negative one. Negative one meaning that it hasn't been scored. Now this could also be a constant if you want it in your program. Now the arrays class, which is a similar class to collections, only for arrays instead of for collections, has a useful method. So let's go and look for it. Here we are in the Java API. And here's the arrays class. 
So the first thing we want to notice is what package it's in, since we'll need the package when we use it. It's in Java Util. That probably shouldn't have been a surprise, since it's similar to the Collections class. So let's read a little bit about the preamble. This class contains various methods for manipulating arrays, such as sorting and searching. It also contains a static factory. Hmm. Okay, now that's getting beyond the scope of what we know, so we're just going to skip over this. The methods in this class all throw a null pointer exception if the specified array reference is null, except where noted. So that's a warning that if you try to call these methods on an array that hasn't been constructed, they're not going to work. Logic would dictate that that would have to be true. So let's go and look for a method that looks promising. Now, one thing you'll notice that's different about the Arrays class than the Collections class is the methods are very, very heavily overloaded. For example, right now I've got almost a whole page of binary search methods. The reason that this is true is that in the Collections class, they use a generic for the objects. And so that means that one version, for example, of binary search can work for all the different types of arrays. But the Arrays class is for arrays of primitive data types as well as arrays of objects. And so that means that every one of these has to be different. So notice there's a version of binary search for double. And in fact, there are two versions of it, one that searches the whole array and one that searches a range. Here's one for float, here's one for int, here's one for long. So this class has a huge number of methods in it. Now we're going to go looking for something that looks useful. Copy of could be a possibility, but there's actually something better hanging around. Let's take a look at fill. So what it does is assigns a specified value to each element in the specified array. Ooh, that's exactly what we want to do. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, but wait a minute, this is just one loop. Why are we working so hard to avoid one loop? Well, we're not, but I did want you to see the arrays package. So I know you could implement this on your own. Oh yes, the other thing we need to pay attention to when we're looking at this class. All of these methods are static methods. That's similar to the Collections class too. Remember the Math class was like that. So in general, these Utility classes tend to have a lot of static methods in them. So let's go and implement that in our code. So we'll do arrays.fill player1 scores with negative 1, and arrays.fill player2 scores with negative 1. I have included the package up at the top. Let me show you. Import java.util.arrays. I've also got the scanner included since we know we're going to need that to interact with the user. And notice that I put all this in the main method. Now, one thing we're going to do differently here than we've done in many of our other programs is we're going to call methods multiple times. The reason is that both players' turns are identical. And it's actually quite important to the fairness of the game that the turns are absolutely positively identical. So we'll write a method that plays a single player turn and then call it twice once for each user. Almost all of the methods should be called once for player one and once for player two. So you're going to use different arguments to control which player is playing. Now this is very different than the single call methods that we've created previously and is actually a more sophisticated programming structure that we will continue to explore. A lot of the loops in this program should be encapsulated into small reusable methods. So let's talk about what some of our utility methods should be. Well, one of them is show current scorecard. So that's going to take the scores array and show it to the user in a pretty format. Now, what you're basically doing is displaying the contents of the array. So that's going to be a single loop. And the output, of course, needs to be formatted nicely so that it's pretty. Another method that's useful is roll all dice. So that's going to take the dice array, the one we haven't created yet, and roll all those dice at once. So notice this is a way of encapsulating a loop into a method. Another method we'll need is going to be called show dice. So that's going to take the dice and show them to the user. They have to know what the dice are in order to be able to play Yahtzee. We're also going to need a method for calculating the total scores. 
Now that's going to take the scores array and return an integer. In this case, we're going to have to deal with the challenge because remember that when a score is negative 1, that means it doesn't count. We're using negative 1 as a flag, not as a score. And so we're going to have to take care of that. The other thing we need is sum of dice. So there's integer dice and an int number. The reason we need sum of dice is in order to calculate the final score. So notice that these are very small methods. A lot of these methods are going to be between 5 and 10 lines long. That's actually an ideal size for a method. Don't get it in your head that methods have to be big, complicated things. The smaller and more reusable methods are actually the better ones. Now, there are some harder methods to be written, too. For example, there's play one game and play one turn and re-roll the dice. So we're going to do those after we do some of our little utility methods so that we get a chance to experiment with using loops with arrays before we try to do more challenging things. Now I put the main methods, the ones that are harder to write up at the top, and we're going to go down and do some of the easier ones. So play one turn is not one of the easier methods, and neither is reroll dice. But calculate total score, on the other hand, that's a pretty simple method to write. So we've got our score array, and what we're going to do is add anything up that isn't equal to negative 1. Here's how that goes. We'll create an integer sum and initialize it to 0. Now remember that with local variables like sum, local variables only live within the method, and they don't get initialized unless you initialize them. Eclipse will nag about this if you don't take care of it. We're also going to need a counter and that's going to start at 0. Now, you could call it count, but maybe a better thing to call it is index, because that's what it really represents. Now, there are two ways we could write this method. We could write it using the length of the array, the remember is passed with the array, or we could use it using the constant turns. I think it's better to use the length of the array that's passed, because then if turns change, it automatically gets updated. So while index is less than score.length, another thing to remember is that score.length with arrays is not a method. It's actually a data field. So that's a problem because you're used to using score.size, which is a method in the ArrayList class. Now these are not very important mistakes. In fact, if you made that mistake on an exam, I wouldn't even take off on a point because it's so unimportant but it is something to watch out for. So if score of index is not equal to negative 1, we'll do sum equals sum plus score of index. Now you could put curly braces there if you want. In fact, let's do it. It's usually better to have some extra curly braces hanging around. And of course, we need to increment index. At the end, we return sum. So let's think about what would happen, for example, if we called this method when the score was all negative ones. We would step through one at a time, and let's think about whether our while loop is correct or not. So we started the index at 0, and we're going to less than score.length. That is a typical Java idiom, and so that's probably correct. So this line where you have if right here, if all of the scores were negative 1, none of that would ever be executed. And so what that means is we'd return a score of 0, which is the correct score to return. So the only thing that's missing here is maybe a little bit of comments. So let's put in two comments. Add up everything that is not negative 1. So scores of negative 1 flag unused rows. That's a way of saying it. So there we've got a nice little method. Now we know Eclipse is happy with it. It might not be a bad idea to go to the main program and test the method just a little bit on its own. So let's do that.
forgot what the method name is. Calculate total score. Very logical method name. So I'm trying to just do a quick and dirty score here. One of the tricks that I use is this when I'm doing this kind of testing. I say what I expected. That way I don't have to rethink through it when I'm looking at the data. Handy little trick. So let's run the program, see what we get. zero and we expected zero. So that's good. That means that method is working. Let's go into another, well, okay, <laughs> that was an exaggeration. We really don't know that that method is working. And in fact, we probably should put some better data in to check it. So now I'm putting test data into this program. This is data that I'm going to remove immediately. So I'm putting in some data here. Now the data doesn't necessarily make sense. So I'm going through and looping through the player one scores array and setting each value to the index. And then of course incrementing the index. So what we're expecting now to see from player one scores is zero plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So one plus two is three plus three is six plus four is 10 plus five is 15. So now we're expecting to see 15. If you're wondering who Maggie is, it's one of my dogs. Okay, so now we have a little better feeling that this is running correctly. Now remember, it was never our intention to leave this code in here. Some people comment things like that out but frankly, I don't like to see those things in code. It makes the code longer, and it makes you wonder if somebody was debugging it. It just creates all kinds of sort of bad karma in the code. So I usually take those out rather than commenting them. But there are different people that do that differently. So let's find another one of these little methods, like sum of dice. Now remember, the thing that's unusual in the sum of dice methods is only the values that are equal to number count. So we're going to do the same thing we did before. We'll create a sum, which is initially zero, and we'll create an index, also initially zero. We'll step through the data one element at a time. Notice again that I use dice.length, not the constant dice. That keeps the code a little bit cleaner. So if dice of index equals number, because you only get to count the values that are the same, then we're going to do sum equals sum plus dice of index. And of course, when we get to the end of the method, we'll return sum. Now let's think a little bit about how we might comment this. The line that's the most obviously in need of commenting is this only dice that equal the given number count. Okay, so there's our sum of dice method. Now, we could test this one separately too. The only problem for testing this one is we don't actually have a dice array at this point. Now, the show dice method I've actually written for you. It's a pretty simple method. It has the same loop, just like we've done with our other loops. The difference is, it now writes out the value on each dice. One thing that you'll notice is because I'm interacting with the user, I'm not showing zero indexing. So what I'm doing with index plus one is unit indexing the dice. The user has to have a name for the dice so he, can, he or she can choose which ones 
to be re-rolled again. And so that's what's going on here. Another thing to notice is that I did have to put that index plus one in parentheses. If you don't do that, that plus, well, you know what, actually in this case it would work. The reason is that remember, pluses associate left to right, which means this plus would be done first. Well, this plus is between two integers, and so it's an integer plus. Then when you have this plus done is when it becomes string concatenation. Nonetheless, I like the look of the parentheses there, and I'm going to leave them. I see that I didn't write the roll all dice method for you, so let's do that. So once again, we're going to step through the elements of the array one at a time. So we'll have an int for an index and we'll set our index to zero. I guess we can just do that on one line. Now while index is less than dice.length, we're going to do dice of index equals. Now earlier in the semester we had a program that rolled dice, and so we know exactly what this math expression is, or at least I do. You might have to go back and look it up in your code, and it's okay to do that if you want. Remember, we had math.random, which generated a value between 0 and 1, where 1 was not included. We multiplied by the number of sides on the dice, which is what turns is. Then we cast it to an integer. And added 1. Now you may not have remembered that right offhand. You certainly could have gone and looked it up. Of course, it would be nice if we had made it a method, because then we could reuse it. But we don't really know much about doing that yet, so. I'm being rather careful to make sure I put increments in all these while loops, so we don't have a whole bunch of infinite loops to debug. Here's the method for showing the user their current score. I wrote this one in advance, too. This kind of code tends to be kind of sticky to write, not because it's logically complicated, but because you want it to be pretty for the user. And that kind of stuff takes some time. So I'll give you an easy way out this morning. So here we have count to zero, count less than turns. Now we might want to think about how I wrote that, because in all of our other arrays, we've been using a variable called index instead of count. That's OK, actually. But we've been using the length of the array. And I really think that's a better way to do things. So I'm going to change that. If the score of count is not equal to negative 1, that means that the person has scored it already. And so the current score for the die and then the number of the die, notice that although our array is 0 indexed, when we're talking with the user, we have to unit index things. And in this case, the parentheses around count plus 1 are really necessary because otherwise this leftmost plus is going to become concatenation between this string, current score for die, and count. And then the plus one there will become another concatenation and we'll end up with something we did not anticipate. So because we want the two integers to be added first, we communicate that to Java with the parentheses. And then we've got the score of count. Now notice the negative one score in the program we don't want to show that stuff to users. Those are the internal logical details of the program. Users should not be burdened by them. In fact, it's quite annoying as a user to have weird stuff like that showing up. So what I put out instead when we have a negative one score is that that category has not been used yet. So that's kind of a nice way to do it. So now we've got our little methods together. And of course, we could test all of them like we tested our first method. So we're going to have to deal with one of our big methods. Now, there are two different ways you can approach this. You could approach it what we call bottom up, that is by working on the little details first, or you can approach it from the top down, that is working with the big picture and then working towards the little details. Neither answer is really right or wrong here. Either one will work perfectly fine. It's up to you to decide which one you're more comfortable with. Now, in this case, I think I want to work top down. So I'm going to start from the main program and work down to playing a game and then playing a turn. Now we're going to use the fact that we have stubs for these methods that we can call because that will make it easier for us to run the program. 
Let's take a look at play one game. Well, let's go back up to the main program first to make sure we know where we are. So here's the main. We have the players under their, their names first. Then we created the arrays of scores. We filled them with the negative ones. We didn't put any comments there. That was kind of unfortunate. A negative one value means that the category has not been played. So we know that what we're going to do here is play one game. Now we can see the play one game method on the screen. So let's put in the names for the players and the arrays. So we've got the name of player one and then player one scores and the name of player two and player two scores and of course the scanner. Now I created a scanner called keyboard up at the top so we'll include that too. So that's going to play the whole game. So now let's go down and take a look at what playing the game consists of. Now I've put in a comment here for play the game in turns. That's the code we're going to have to write. The code that I didn't comment out that I didn't remove before we started working on this was calculate total score. So after you finish playing the game, you're going to calculate the scores for player one and player two. Notice I'm calling the same method with two different arrays and that makes it work differently. So for example, we pass the argument player one score to the calculate total score parameter and that's the one that gets used to find score one. When we call calculate total score with player two score on the other hand, we're calculating the score from the second array. So this is code reuse. This is the way things are supposed to be done. And then all I have here is just an if statement that's telling who won. Probably would be nice to tell people what the total score is too because people tend to be kind of competitive about things like that. That's something we could improve in the program. Okay, so let's think about how we're going to play the game in turns. Well, first off, how many turns are there? If you think about it, there are six lines on the scorecard. Every single turn you use up one of those lines. So you're going to have to have six turns. So int turns is zero while turns is less than, remember we had a constant for turns, and then turns equals turns plus one. Okay, so what should we do here? Well, remember that we have a method that we're going to write later, it's just a stub right now, called play one turn. Also notice, while we're looking at play one turn, the play one turn doesn't have the name of the player. So if we're going to give any feedback on who's playing to the user, we need to do it in this method. So let's say system out print line. player one, what should we call it? Oh, we just call it name one here. So we're telling the user who's going to get to play first. So we're going to just have name one play first and name two play second. It actually doesn't matter what order turns are in in Yahtzee. There's no advantage to being the one who plays first. So then we'll say play one turn and that's going to take player one score and of course the scanner. Now here's the second player. System out print line. You could copy and paste for this too, right? And then we'll play one turn player two score from the keyboard. Well, that's actually all there is to playing the game. <laughs> of course, the reason it's so easy to write this method is because we have delayed the details of playing one turn into the next method. So notice this breaking things apart into small pieces actually makes the code writing quite straightforward. 
So all we have here is a simple while loop. So it's probably a good time to run the program and make sure things are working the way we expected. Now let's think about what we expect. There is no actual turn here. So what we should see is Deborah and Maggie, it is your turn, alternating for six times. And then we should see calculate total score returning zero, and it should be a tie. Now, I've gone through that rather quickly, but notice the code is all here, so you can go through it more slowly at your leisure. So the first player's name is Deborah. I'll still play the family dog. So let's take a look and make sure everything looks right. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six Debras, one, two, three, four, five, six Maggies, and in fact, we did get a tie. You might also notice that it is a little frustrating to not know the scores, so let's actually put that in too. So let's say system out print line, name one, your, whoops, no capital, your score is plus score one. Now this time I am going to copy and paste this code. Let's put in a little comment here. The reason I'm copying and pasting the code is to make sure that it's absolutely parallel. So name two, your score is score two. And let's make some comments up here. So the game has one turn for every possible outcome. And players alternate playing. There is no advantage to playing first because this is dominated by randomness. So notice I'm taking some of the things that we talked about while we were writing the code and putting it in. The other thing to notice is that I'm documenting the code when I write it. Sometimes students get into the bad habit of writing tons of code and then trying to go back at the end and document it. That's really a bad habit. For one thing, writing code without documenting it while you're doing it is a bad habit. Also, when you go back later, you don't really know exactly what you were thinking. And so that makes it hard too. So really focus on making sure that you have documentation in the code. As a general rule for every thought in the program, for example, the while loop is a thought, you want to have a comment that describes what you were thinking. There's a saying in computer science that when the code doesn't match the comments, they're usually both wrong. And the reason is that when somebody writes code and doesn't comment it, that probably means they were trying to work quickly. And when you work quickly, you tend to make a lot of mistakes. Plus, when you go back later and put things in, here you have code that's likely to have mistakes in it, and you're just kind of slapping comments on top of it. So it's a sign of a professional lapse, one that computer scientists actually take pretty seriously. So let's see if our program's a little more satisfying to play now. Okay, well that actually does feel a little more satisfying is to know what the scores are. But let's count again. One, two, three, four, five, six Debras. One, two, three, four, five, six Maggies. Scores are both zero. It's a tie. One thing I do notice is that I have a period after it's a tie, but not after the scores and not after the turns. I know these are little things, but remember I'm a professional and I want my work to always look beautiful. This is part of looking beautiful. And you know, these, even though we haven't tested these yet, we're gonna want those to look beautiful too.
okay, so we've done some more work, so let's run it again, particularly because running it isn't very hard at this point. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Now the rubber is getting ready to meet the road. Let's talk about what consists of playing one turn. Well, let's put in comments. So let's think through what a turn of Yahtzee looks like. You're going to need to show the user their scorecard. The reason they need to know their scorecard is so that they can strategize how they're going to play their roles. Then you need to roll all of the dice, show the dice to the user, let them re-roll the dice, then show them the dice again, and let them re-roll again. Remember there are three possibilities. Now the other thing we have to do is to score the rolls. So we might think about how we're going to do that. Now this does sound like something that might be a little more complicated, so we might think about whether this should be a separate method. But for now, let's leave it here. So what we would do is show the user the dice, ask them for a category to score, and score that category. Wow, it looks like so much. But remember, we have a whole bunch of really cool methods written for doing this. So it's actually not going to be that much work. In fact, we might end up removing some of these comments because if you think about it, they're virtually identical to the names of the methods we've written previously. Now, as for how I created those method names, I actually was writing this method. And every time I would write something like show the user their scorecard, I'd think, oh, that should be a method. And so then I'd create the signature for the method. So let's go and find these methods one at a time and put in the correct values. So show the user their scorecard is called show current scorecard. And it takes an argument that's a score. But that's a capital C. Okay, Eclipse looks happier now. Then we have roll all the dice. Well, wait a minute, what dice? Well, now's the time we need to actually create some dice. So we'll have an integer array, which I'm going to call dice. And let's construct it. New int. There are five dice in Yahtzee. So now when we go to roll all the dice, which was another one of the methods we wrote, we can give it the dice array. Now I think you may see what I'm talking about with the comments here, that we've done such a good job of creating descriptive method names that these comments are not really helping us out much. So that, those are comments you might think about removing. Now show the dice to the user. I believe we called that show dice. Now the re-roll the dice. That method's down here. We haven't written that one yet. So we call it re-roll dice. Now rerolling the dice requires interaction with the user, so we know that's going to need to have the keyboard as an argument. Then we show the dice to the user. So notice that even though this is quite a complicated method, it's not very hard to do. Then we reroll the dice again.
So really, the only part that's complicated is scoring the roles. So let's think a little bit about some other structural changes we might want to make. Do you notice that we repeated several lines of code? So for example, we had roll all dice, show dice, re-roll dice, show dice, re-roll dice, and we're going to have a show dice right down in here. We could create that as a loop, but frankly, because it's only two times, that's really not worth it. We would have to have an index, we'd have to have a counter in the loop, so that makes it a little bit more complicated. So let's just improve the documentation a little bit. So we need to show the user the dice. We know how to do that. And now ask them for a category to score. So system out print line, which category would you like to score in? And then we'll get input from the keyboard. Now, we've got a problem here because the user might try to score in a category where they've already scored. It's very painful to get five sixes and know that you've already used your sixes category. So we probably want to do some error checking. And we also should not assume that they're going to always type things inaccurately. So there's some mistakes we can't catch, like typing in a different category than what you meant. But typing in things that are out of bounds that are going to break the program or typing in a category that's already been used are things we want to look for. So while, now remember, we're repeating this loop when these things fail. So what are the failing conditions? Well, the category less than zero is one of them. Or the category greater than turns is another one. So those are the out of bounds conditions. We might also want to think about whether we're using less than, greater than, or less than or equal, or greater than or equal to. So a category of zero is a legal category, which means the illegal condition is in fact less than. But when we look at category turns, turns is not legal. Remember our array stops at turns minus one because of this crazy zero indexing thing. So in this case, we'll have category greater than or equal to turns. Now the other thing that we might consider is whether it's already been used. So that's the other way this could go wrong, is to have score of category equals, whoops, sorry, not equals, but not equal to negative one. Remember that the only categories you're allowed to score in are the ones where it's negative one. So we're putting a little while loop in here. We need to give the user some feedback. And let's remind them about the scoring rules. and then let them enter the data again. So let's give them another line of output for that. So we'll say category equals keyboard.nextint. So that will keep them there until they score it correctly. Now, once they've entered it correctly and we get down here, we need to know that score of category equals, well, what is the score for that category? Well, remember we had that nice little method that we probably called something like sum all dice. Don't remember exactly, so let's go and look for it. Sum of dice. And so we need the dice and we need the number.
Let me show you another trick that you can use in Eclipse for keeping track of some of these method names. Right here in the Package Explorer, if you click on it, it will actually show you all of your method names right there. As programs get larger, it's nicer and nicer to be able to read all those signatures. Now, of course, this does take up some screen space, so you have to sort of play off it and decide which one you like. But it is a very nice feature, and it's also a very good incentive to create those method signatures first. Okay, so let's think about what we're doing here. What should the play look like if we ran the program at this point? Well, we're going to be asked to score categories, but we're not going to be able to re-roll dice. So we'll see the original dice probably three times pretty quickly, and then we're going to ask to score the category. So that gives us an idea of what we're expecting. Now what we could do is choose a category where things don't score, and then we'd know what the score would be. Now that's not always possible, because it is possible that we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Oh, it isn't possible that we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think we're going to have trouble creating that zero score, though. So what we're going to have to do is just follow through and make sure things are in the right place. So notice we can do all this without the re-roll dice, which, by the way, is kind of a sticky method to implement being implemented. So here we go. Well, that was strange. What happened there is that I had accidentally clicked on a different project, and so Eclipse was running that project. This looks more like it. Okay. So here's the turn. We have category one has not been used yet, so it's showing my scorecard. We might want to put a little label in that so that we know that that's the scorecard coming up. Then what you'll see is we have five dice that have been rolled and re-rolled and re-rolled. Notice they're remaining the same through all three rolls, so that's good. Now which category would we like to score in? Well, you know what? I think I'd like to score category six because I see I've got a couple of sixes. And uh, those sixes are kind of important in Yahtzee. Now it says that's not a legal category. Remember, you can't rescore in a category. Well, that's kind of odd. So we need to go back to our code and check and see what happened. Well, if you'll notice what happened, this is the code we're looking at right here, right where we're throwing out categories. The categories here are zero indexed. And we really didn't take that into consideration. So once they score here, Let's make some comments. When you communicate with the user, you have to use unit indexing. But then when you go to communicate with the program, you need to change it to zero indexing. So that's how we can do that. Now remember, we need to do that here too. Okay. Let me change that minus sign to an equal and make Eclipse happy. And then we'll run the program again. Okay, 35623, 35623, 35623. So we're not doing any re-rolling. We knew that already. So let's score that in category four and see what happens. Uh-oh, we're stuck. So we need to think about that. Where might we be stuck? Well, it can't be in reroll dice because we don't have any reroll here. We know that we got out of this because we know that the category was red. So we might think about sum of dice and see if something went wrong there. That looks like the first place where we could have lost something. So let's take a look at sum of dice and see if anything's wrong. And of course, I'm sure you'll recognize one of my famous mistakes. I forgot to increment the index. 
Now this is something that we could have done better earlier. For example, if we had tested the program, we probably would have found it earlier instead of finding the infinite loop now. But we found it one way or another, so I guess we're okay. So here we go again. Okay, none of the categories have been used. It's my turn. 54513, 54513, 54513. Let's score that in category six. Now the score here should be zero. So let's see what happens there. Well, we're now at Maggie's turn, so remember none of her things have been scored yet. So we'll have 25251, and that's been repeated correctly. Let's score that in category three. So both Maggie and I should now have a zero in one of our categories. So the current score for die six is 10. Wait a minute, what happened there? That isn't correct. So let's stop the program and go and look at it. Now, this is gonna be our sum of dice method again. So notice, the method that we did not test thoroughly is the one that's causing us the grief now. So let's see what happened here. Well, if dice.index equals number. Well, now did we store the dice unit indexed or zero indexed? These are the kind of things that are gonna go wrong. So let's think about what we're doing here. Sum of dice is actually looking pretty good at this point. We start the index at zero. We step through the index one unit at a time. If it is the number, we add it to the sum. Otherwise, we don't do anything. And in either case, we increment the index. So that looks good. Maybe we should go back and make sure that die, well, okay, we know the current score for die six can't be 10. Let's look and see what happened in that turn. One thing you may be noticing here is that it's a little hard to do this kind of debugging because of the alternating of turns. So let's actually go and modify the program a little bit. Let's remove the alternating turns because then we'll be able to just play with one player. That's probably a better strategy. So here we go. So I'm disabling the second player's turn now. Once we get turns working, it will be very easy to enable that again. The other thing I'm gonna disable at this point is re-rolling. And the reason is that we haven't written that method yet. So let's just disable these for the moment. And this will make it a lot easier to debug our program. So part of debugging is finding good ways to make things simple. Okay, now we're still gonna be asked for two player names because we didn't disable that part. My turn, categories haven't been used. So we see our dice, they're the same. Let's score them in category six. So now category six should have a score of 12 and it says the current score for die six is zero. Well, isn't that weird? So that actually is not correct. So now it's time to go through and look very carefully and see what might've gone wrong. So let's look at how we're showing the dice, just to make sure we understand how they've been scored. So we're showing the actual dice at that index. Okay, that looks correct. That tells us we didn't store the dice zero indexed, which would be a silly thing to do, but would be the kind of things that might work out. So let's look again at that number, not in the sum of dice method, because that one's looking good, but right up here. So when we pass in the category, is the category unit indexed or zero indexed? Well, at this point, remember, we've changed it so that it's zero indexed. Notice this is where having some comments really makes a difference. So what we should have done, because the dice are unit indexed, 
is put in category plus one. And let's actually make a comment here that the category has to be unit indexed in the method. So the zero indexing versus unit indexing causes a lot of challenges. Let's see if things are looking a little better now. Running the program again. So let's put this in category six. Now this should score six points in category six. That's looking good. Let's score this in category six too and see what happens. That's not a legal category. Remember, you can't rescore. Good. Let's try category negative one. That's not a legal category. Let's try category zero. That's not a legal category. How about category five? Now that should score zero, which is actually what it did. Now in this one, we've got a couple of numbers that are the same, so let's score that in category one. Now why is category one not a legal category at this point? Oh, because we've already scored in that category. Sorry, the program jumped ahead a turn. So our categories that are available are two, three, and four. Let's go to two. Okay, so we've got categories three and four left. Let's score this in category three and score in category four, which is our only one that's remaining. We're not playing a very good game of Yahtzee here, by the way. Our score is 17. Now let's add up and see if that's actually correct. So the score on the last one should have been four. So we have two, four, seven, 11, and six is 17. So that looks like it's scoring really well. Now, at this point, we could turn back on the second player, but it's using identical logic, so we don't think that's gonna be any different. Instead, the logic that we should test next is the reroll method, because that one's gonna be a little bit trickier. So we show the dice to the user. We're gonna to have to ask them which dice would you like to re-roll? And there we run into a challenge. Let's talk about re-rolling dice a little bit. Handling the user interaction is a little bit tricky. So first off, you have to consider the possibility that the user is gonna be satisfied with their dice and not wish to re-roll them. So we'll have to use a negative one flag for that or some other flag. That was the first one that came to my mind. But there's also another problem and that's that we don't know how many dice they want to re-roll. Now we could come up with some elaborate way to work around this, but it really makes sense to have the user tell you which ones they want to re-roll. Now your first thought to this might be that we should use has next int in the scanner class, but this actually doesn't work. Let me go to the documentation and show you what the problem is. Going to the scanner class, And let's look at has next int. It's right here. Returns true if the next token in the scanner's input can be interpreted as an int value in the default radix. Now when they say this default radix stuff, what they mean is base 10 in our case. The scanner does not advance past any input. So the problem with using a scanner for this, using has next int, is that it will wait to see what the next value is. Well, the next value occurs later on in the program. So this will actually hang your program if you try to use next int. So we need a clever workaround. What the solution is, is to read all the values into a string and then create a scanner for the string. Now it turns out when you create a scanner from a string, it does know that it doesn't have another integer because it knows where the string ends. And so that fixes the problem. So let's go and implement. So I'm gonna create a string, which I'm gonna call input line, and that's gonna be keyboard.nextLine. 
we might tell them to enter negative one if you do not wish to re-roll. So we get our next line, then we're cr gonna create a scanner, which I'm gonna call a dice number. Mm, I don't like that. Uh, let's see, what are we gonna call that scanner? I'll call it just line. So I'm creating the scanner with a different constructor than the one we usually use. So rather than attaching it to the keyboard, I'm attaching it to the string that's the next input line. We're gonna to need to get the first dice value out. Now we can't call it dice because that's the name of the array. So I'll call it reroll value. And that's gonna be line.nextInt. Now if the reroll value is negative one, that means they've said that they don't want to re-roll any of the dice. And so what we should do at that point is return. And I see that I missed an equal sign here. This is an equality comparison, right? Not an assignment statement. So that's a nice way to get out of there. Now we're gonna to have to consider what happens if it's not negative one. So while line dot has next int. So as long as there's still data to process. Now we're gonna have to think about what we wanna do here. For example, should this stuff right here be inside this loop? So let's think through the logic carefully. If they enter a negative one, we definitely wanna get out of there, but we can get out inside of the while loop too. If we don't move that stuff in there, we're gonna to have to prime our input. But that's a problem, because then has next int won't fail at the correct time. So let's cut this and move it into the loop. This is a case where we do not want to prime our input, and that's dictated by the logic of has next int. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is dice of reroll value minus one, because remember, unit indexed. So let's actually document this. So dice of reroll value minus one is gonna equal, and then we just need to generate another random number. So we know what that looks like. Having done it a couple of times now. Now, we also might wanna consider what happens if the user makes a mistake in the input. That is, what if that value isn't legal? Well, in my opinion, in this particular case, we may just tell them they messed up and not let them re-roll. Now, this makes our programming easier, but also it makes the user pay attention to what they're doing. That seems kind of mean-spirited and it may not be a good idea. We'll have to see how it feels when we're playing the game. If re-roll value is less than zero or re-roll value is greater than or equal to turns, what we're gonna do is say system out print line that is not a legal value, no dice will be re-rolled or rolled again. I guess that's a little bit nicer. Now, in order for that to actually be true, this needs to go in and out. And in fact, this else is actually quite important because if we didn't have that, what would happen is that it would try to roll it again. Well, we know the value they've given us isn't legal, and so that wouldn't work. Oh yeah, we might wanna think here about turns versus dice. So is it the number of 
dice they're re-rolling or the number of turns? I'm pretty sure that's number of dice. Of course, some of these things will come out in testing as we move along. Okay, let's think through the logic again just to be sure we're doing the right thing. We create a scanner from the string that has all of the values on it. Then we read the first integer, if there is one. If there is a negative one that's read in, we get out of there because that means they didn't want to re-roll anything. If the value is out of range, we tell them they messed up. Otherwise, we re-roll the dice. And we do that as long as there's input. So that looks pretty good. Now notice we're changing our dice array. That's fine, it's okay to change an array in a method, and those changes do get reflected in the main method. Let's go and play our game. Now I'm gonna give us a little more space because this is gonna get longer. And you know what, I'm gonna stop it right away because I believe we still have our re-rolling commented out. So let's go and enable that part of the game again. And now we can play. I have not enabled two-player play at this point, again, to keep things a little bit simpler. So it's my turn. No categories have been used. Well, we've got a couple of fives there, so let's re roll one, two, and five. Now, that's a problem. So that says, which dice would you like to re-roll? Enter negative one. I entered one, two, and five, and it didn't really tell us which one was illegal. What's more, it lied about some of the dice being re-rolled. In fact, we can kind of see which ones were re-rolled. So one got re-rolled because it changed values. Two got re-rolled, but five looks like the one that didn't. So that's probably an off by one bug that we're gonna wanna check on. Let's do negative one and see what happens. 15553, five, five, so that looks good. And we'll score that in category five. Okay, so let's go and look for our off by one bug. So it looks like category five is not being treated correctly. Let's think about the categories now. The category here is zero indexed. Oh, wrong place, should be in re-rolling the dice. So if it's less than zero, or value is greater than or equal to dice, well, let's think about it. This is unit indexed. Well, then less than zero isn't correct. That should be less than or equal to zero, and this should be greater than dice. So this unit indexing versus zero indexing has the potential for causing all kinds of problems with arrays. So notice here we change it to zero indexing when we store it but at this point, it's unit indexed. Now, we could rewrite the logic so that we could change it to zero indexing sooner, but remember that that will then mess up this return value. So we need to be careful when we do these things. Let's see if things are working a little better now. Okay, so we've got three threes, ooh, that looks nice. So let's re-roll dice number one and dice number five. Okay, those are the correct ones that got re-rolled. Let's try some illegal values here, like zero and six. So we got two illegal values, that's good. And which category would we like to score? And well, I think I'd like to score that in category three. And we scored three threes, which is nine. So that's looking good. Now. Here we have some dice. Got one, five, one, six, two ones. And yeah, let's go for some more fives. So let's re-roll one, two, four, and five. So you can see one got re-rolled. It's hard to tell with two. Remember, it is randomly possible to get the same thing. Three did not get re-rolled. And we can see that four and five did. So that looks like that's going well. Let's score that in category four and it scored an eight, so that's looking good. 
Now we could continue playing this game and notice that we're going to have to check it very, very carefully in order to make it work. Now, if you've been watching really carefully, you may have noticed that something is actually going wrong here. Do you notice how we're skipping ahead on some of these rerolls? Well, we probably know what that problem is. That's going to be a problem with forgetting to read in a new line. So let's go and fix that one and get our interaction working exactly right. Now we don't know exactly where the problem is. So we know the problem comes in when you read in an integer. So we're going to look for places where we called read int. So there are no integers entered there. This is all output, not input. Right here is where we read in an integer. So what we should do is keyboard dot next line. So that's one possibility. It's here again. So we'll do keyboard dot next line. And let's just keep looking through our program. Now this one is reading a whole string. So this one is reading the end of line correctly. So we don't have to worry about it in there. And we only have to look at other methods that actually have a scanner in them. So we don't have to examine this one or that one, because if there is no scanner, we weren't reading any input. And in fact, if you think about it, most of these methods weren't reading input. So we probably have that fixed. Let's give ourselves some room and play again and see if the interaction is better. Remember, I'm still playing in one user mode. Now, if you missed that, you probably wouldn't have if you were sitting at the keyboard and playing the game. Uh, let's see, let's re-roll dice, uh, dice one, three, and four. Ooh, we got another six. Now we're going to re-roll dice one and four. Yeah, still, that's pretty good. So let's score it in category six. We got three sixes, that's looking good. So let's go for maybe category five next. So two, three, four, five would be the dice we'd re-roll. Yeah. Got one at least, so let's re-roll now two, three, and five. Well, we still got two fives. So let's score that in category five. Two fives scoring a 10, and we can go on like this. So here's a good one to start for category two, so let's just re-roll two and three, and then just re-roll three, and score it in category two. Notice we got four of those, so the score is eight. Now let's go for category three. So we'll go one, two, four, five. Ooh, and now two and five. Ooh, look at that. So let's score that in category three. Category four and one are the ones that are remaining. Let's go for category one next, since we've got a couple of ones. One, two, three. Well, you don't really make much money off category one, one way or another. So the last thing we're going to do is category four. Now, unfortunately, we need to reroll all the dice. At least we got two fours out of that. So let's reroll one, two, and four. And now we've got three fours and we'll score in category four. And poor little Maggie didn't get any score. Notice that we do seem to have some junk on the line with Maggie's score. So we might want to go and fix that and then re-enable two-player play and play it again. So we know that score was printed out in play one game. Oh, and look at that. Right there it is. An ugly little extra quote. So this is all we have to re-enable to be playing the full program. Now, Of course, we had run the whole thing, meticulously checking every single line to make sure everything was perfect, but it looks to me like we've got it done. 
so keep programming.